I want to start this morning with an opening reading that is a little on the longer side. That's okay. The, Bi the Bible reading is on the shorter side today, so we'll, uh, we'll balance it all out. This is from uh, a poet and essayist, Brian Doyle, who um, died too young several years ago, but I return to his work every now and again because I love the way that he encourages me to notice the small things around me. So this is kind of a long, he calls them proems, prose poems, um, that is about a, a moment when he was a young, a young person freshly graduated from college. One of life's smaller moments that, uh, that uh, carried with him a long while. Down by Fulton Fish Market, it's called. I graduated from college in May and started looking for jobs a week later, but no jobs were looking for me. I was worried about coins, so I did not ride the subway, but instead plodded from the battery all the way to 155th Street and east to west, including both upper sides of Central Park. I tried museums, newspapers, publishing houses, magazines, history societies, 10 libraries, jazz clubs, and even once a sailor's benevolent society down by Fulton Fish Market. That interview trickles back into my memory this morning, redolent and mysterious, for the interviewer understood that there was no work for me, nor would I have been qualified for whatever work might have been available, but that I was weary and frightened and bleak. And he poured a cup of the darkest, densest coffee and invited me to talk about, chip, about ships and the sea and stories and what labors I ultimately had in mind if I was going to do work that I loved. We sat there for two hours easy, chatting about Joshua Slocum and Captain James Cook and Jack London and various ships I had seen for myself, like the whaler Charles W. Morgan, and ships on which he had served, both mercantile and U.S. naval. And I bubbled on and on about Stevenson and Kipling and C.S. Forrester and how my plan to was, was to work for newspapers, because what could conceivably be cooler than reporting in New York? And while working on newspapers, eventually as the editor, I'd write books on the side and essays too, of course, and here and there perhaps a poem so that someday I'd have a slim volume of poems with, to my name. Wouldn't that be cool? Because everyone should commit a slim volume of poems, don't you think? Even now I can see his face, wrinkled and amused and sort of kindly in a ragged way. Hewn is a good word. I was too self-absorbed then to turn myself off and listen to him, a far more fascinating man. But I think now that I learned a great deal from him. Grace, patience, empathy, kindness, listening, humility, the way an ear can be an oar to someone who has been drifting, lost, and lonely. The Bible reading for this morning uh, comes from Matthew chapter 7. This is still a part of the long piece in Matthew called the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is giving this long series of teachings. And this one goes like this. He says, be on your guard against false prophets who come to you disguised as sheep, but underneath are ravenous wolves. Then he, make, then he switches up the metaphor. You will be able to judge them by their fruit. Can people pick grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, a sound tree produces good fruit and a rotten tree produces bad fruit. A sound tree cannot produce rotten fruit and a rotten tree cannot produce good fruit. Any tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. I repeat you'll be able to tell them by their fruit. That's the reading. I'm not a master gardener. I, I would be embarrassed for Ruth to come to my house and see what's going on with the vegetation there. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you where I live, Ruth. <laughs> um, there's no, no amount of standing up here and pretending pretending to be Jesus with pithy agricultural metaphors would change that. I would just be blowing smoke. But I'm still going to tell you about my trees. It's kind of an embarrassing story, actually. 
Our yard is not large, but it's, it's big enough for the two of us, Kathy and me, and for, for where we are in West Germantown, it, it fits into the landscape there. Um, when we moved into the house in 2007, there was a great big mulberry tree in the yard. Um, it housed birds and squirrels, and every summer it covered our yard and driveway and cars in jam. Um, my absolute favorite part about that tree was, was not the tree itself, but it was about watching the morning doves that would come after the berries had been moldering on the ground for a long while, and they would eat it and get tipsy off of the fermented juice. And there would be just the slightest unhinged note in their cooing as they sort of tottered around the, the driveway. I was always a little bit anxious about the neighborhood cats at that point, um, but that was it was fun to watch, funny to watch. The, the tree was not healthy, though. There was a kind of a constant brown ooze that would just come out of it from the top. It rolled all the way down the trunk to the ground. And we had someone come out to look at it, and they told us that the problem was this mulberry tree was actually two or maybe three trees that had wound themselves together as they were growing up. And the pressure uh, of where they were together created an infection of some sort, and that there was nothing to do about it. It was going to kill the tree. Um, so we had, we had somebody come in and cut it down. We got a nectarine tree from, from the city, one of their tree giveaways. Uh, the first year, it made exactly one nectarine. On the very morning that I intended, I checked it the night before, the next morning, I was going to go out and harvest our perfectly formed nectarine. And I stepped outside, and there was the nectarine on the ground with two or three bites taken out of it that were about the size of a squirrel's mouth. <laughs> Jesus needed a parable about the squirrels, man. <laughs> Um, the, the next three years or so, I'm not sure what happened to it. It would make more nectarines, but they came out malformed and mushy, and they always had some, something oozing out of them. So uh, something was clearly wrong with the tree, so I did what Jesus said to do in the Bible. I cut it down. <laughs> Um, I was very sad about it, but it was time to let it go. We've got a young service berry tree, a younger red bud tree, um, and, and a pear tree. The, the less said about the forsythia bush, the better. Uh, it's just out of control. The red bud is growing well after a couple of years. The, the first two years, the service berry got something called a cedar rust, which uh, deformed some of the branch joints and turned the berries inedible, made some nasty thing grow off of them. But I did what the internet said to do. Uh, and then this year, we had a bumper crop of service berries. I, I ate some of them. Uh, the squirrels and birds ate more of them. Um, but it was exciting. Uh, the pear tree is supposedly a dwarf pear tree, but don't tell it that. Um, it has also had a banner year. It also has problems. It had the normal fruit drop that fruit trees do to, to thin out uh, what, what, they have, what they're growing on them, but uh, it also has never really stopped dropping the fruits. Uh, um, there, there are pears aplenty. Um, many of them are malformed and have nasty, mushy spots. Some of them have rotted all the way through. But I've also collected at least two drawers full of pears that have ripened and been near perfect and left juice all over my cheeks. So yes, we need someone with actual knowledge to come and check it out, but that's not the point of the story, really. The point is that we are getting both good fruit and rotten fruit from the same tree. I'm not saying that to impugn Jesus' agricultural knowledge. Uh, he was uh, connected to the land in a, in a much deeper way than I am. Um, his parables and metaphors use the stuff of life to prod people into maybe thinking in new ways and seeing truth in a, in a deep way. 
And he had a whole range of examples that he would draw on for particular lessons. It's interesting to do a, a comparison of this good tree, good fruit, bad tree, bad fruit uh, metaphor with the other place that it shows up, which is in Luke's gospel. Neither Mark nor John uh, have any version of this. In, in Matthew, as we heard, Jesus uses this to warn his hearers away from false prophets, uh, the, the bad trees making bad fruit, whatever. Um, in Luke, Jesus, uh, it's, it's put in a place where Jesus is saying that people shouldn't judge others, um, but should pay attention to their own selves. Uh, and, and, and whether what's coming from them demonstrates something good inside them or something rotten inside of them. In Luke, Jesus is concerned with how the habits of the heart shape how one exists in the world. It's possible that each of the gospel authors adapted this one single teaching to their own version of the story, but it's equally possible that Jesus used the same story in a couple of different ways to make a couple of different points. I mean, the dude had a teaching career that lasted three years. Uh, and Matthew's 28 chapters and Luke's 24 chapters cannot be exhaustive accounts of three years. I mean, I teach the same class year after year. If you sit in my classes for three years in a row, First of all, God help you. I don't know why you would do that. But second of all, you would notice that I use the same stories over and over, but they shift a little bit in the telling. Um, an audience will do that to a storyteller. So I'm, I'm not taking anything away from Jesus by suggesting that his tree and fruit metaphor is not all-encompassing. I'm taking him seriously as a rabbi and a storyteller. I want to tease out the implications, test the boundaries of what he's saying. Whether we take Luke's version, watch yourself, or Matthew's version, watch the, watch the, the false prophets, the metaphor is useful. Pay attention to the habits of your heart and your mind because they shape your way of being and interacting in the world. And as far as being on guard against false prophets, <laughs> There's low-hanging fruit on this one, and it's got a fresh mug shot, but I'll uh, leave that alone. We need to recognize demagoguery for what it is. That's true. I'm a, I'm a fan of Maya Angelou's advice that was paraphrased most clearly uh, in an interview with Oprah Winfrey, that um, when people show you who they are, believe them. There's wisdom in not eating the fruits that you have seen to be bad. Self-preservation and self-care are not dirty words. They're not sinful. We are meant to flourish, not to be used up by other people. But Jesus also knew that everything wasn't that simplistic. The, the reading itself says you won't get grapes from thorns or figs from thistles. The environment matters. He's got that whole other expansive parable about a planter throwing seeds on different kinds of soil. And, and he observes that the different soils will generate different results. Human beings are deeply impacted by the environments, the conditions in which they are formed. That's where my pear tree that's making both bad fruit and delicious fruit comes in to jump into the conversation with Jesus by offering a, a counterexample. And what that counterexample might offer, I think, is a move toward compassion, which is not the same as sucking it up when the rotten, free tr fruit is, the rotten tree is dropping its rotten fruit all over you. You don't have to pull up a chair and just sit underneath it. This is not about self-annihilation. It does not mean there should be a lack of accountability. But it maybe offers a way to breathe, or to use another earthy metaphor, to stay grounded. Because experiencing the worst in people tends to bring out the worst in ourselves. Learning and practicing compassion might help to encourage some other kind of growth in us. 
Shortly after I got home from visiting my parents, my mom forwarded me a New York Times interview with a, a man who's called, uh, who, who, is, who was once called the world's happiest man. Um, Matthew Ricard is a Frenchman with a PhD in cellular genetics. He's also, his, his primary vocation at this point, he is a, a, an ordained Buddhist monk uh, who has served as the French interpreter for the Dalai Lama. Um, early in this interview that my mom sent me, a health crisis isn't going to stop my mom from reading. Uh, early in this interview, the author, David Marchese, explains that he sometimes finds himself getting aggravated over things that don't matter, uh, and he would like to stop doing that. But then he goes on to say he, he wonders if there are things that require an angry response. This, this question and, the, uh, and uh, Ricard's response to it, they seem to me worth just reading at length. So I'm going to do that. Marchese says, it's not the best thing to say, but I can easily imagine wanting certain people to suffer. I, I sympathize with that quite a bit. How are we supposed to deal gracefully with our polar opposites in a world that feels increasingly about polarities? I mean, the Dalai Lama could talk to Vladimir Putin all he wants, but Putin's not going to say, your compassion has changed me. <laughs> Ricard responds, this is kind of a long response. He says, once a long time ago, someone said to me, who is the person you would like to spend 24 whole hours with, alone with? I said, Saddam Hussein. I said, maybe, maybe some small change in him might be possible. When we speak of compassion, you want everybody to find happiness, no exception. You cannot just do that for those who are good to you or close to you. It has to be universal. You may say that Putin and Bashar al-Assad are the scum of humanity, and rightly so. But compassion is about remedying the suffering and its cause. How would that look? You can wish the, that the system that allowed someone like them to emerge is changed. I sometimes visualize Donald Trump going to hospitals, taking care of people, taking migrants to his home. You can wish that cruelty, the indifference, the greed may disappear from these people's minds. That's compassion. That's being impartial. And then Marchese asks a follow-up question that I is also pretty important. He says, why does compassion have to be universal? Ricard responds that, first of all, having compassion doesn't mean that you don't make moral judgments. Moral judgments are still important. Instead, he says, quote, Compassion is to remedy suffering wherever it is, whatever form it takes and whoever causes it. So what is the object of compassion here? It is the hatred and the person under its power. If someone beats you with a stick, you don't get angry with the stick, you get angry with the person. These people we're talking about are like sticks in the hands of ignorance and hatred. We can judge the acts of a person at a particular time. But compassion is wishing that the present aspect of suffering and the causes of suffering may be remedied. That's a shift and a challenge to think of people who are causing harm and suffering as being sticks in the hands of ignorance or hatred. Or maybe to take Jesus' imagery, to think of them as the fruit of that troubled tree. But it may just be that embracing this shift will allow us to pass moral judgments and to seek justice and redress in new and creative ways that don't keep us responding to rotten fruit by picking at and showing off our own mushiest parts. And this, I think, is God's good news. Amen.